Welcome to Lab Talk Radio. Today's topic is Silicon Mass, a peek into the world of Mission Impossible. We have George Frangadakis with us, and he is the co-owner of Immortal Mass in Hollywood, California. Hello, George. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm super excited about this one. Let's begin with telling us your story. Well, I grew up in the South Bay Area, so I'm actually from where you are. Yeah, I grew up in Saratoga. A pretty normal life out there. I also went to St. Andrews in the Saratoga. I went to Bellarmine later for, for high school. And I think during those you know, early years, I developed my, I think everybody in high school kind of has their paths. They follow and, and, and pop culture was my thing. Some people are going to sports and some people go to academics and I dabbled in each one of them, but I think really, if anything, I was more lured into the pop culture part of life, which would be movies, music, and the scene that kind of came around there. So a lot of my friends growing up in the Silicon Valley in, you know, in the 80s were into specific punk rock and, and the mod scene. And that's what I gravitated to and in music. So there was always a sense of the creative side to me when I was growing up. However, most of us, we grew up without the benefit of having the internet available to us. So I think early on, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life when it came down to picking a occupation. Honestly, if I had to go back and look, doing what I do now for a living would have made the most sense. I just had no idea how to get there. Mm -hmm. So like many kids when they turn 18 and they're going off to college and someone says, what are you gonna do for the rest of your life? I had no clue. Uh, <laughs> and my father was a, a dentist in the Cupertino and obviously an inspiration in my life. So I just picked that. I said, I'm just, I'm going to do what dad does. I'm going to be a dentist. And I yeah. really honestly had no desire to become a dentist at all, but I didn't know what I wanted to become. So I went to the University of Pacific in Stockton, California, and I was pre-dental. And there really isn't a pre-dental major, so you kind of pick a major that falls yeah. into those prerequisites. So I was a biochem major. I was probably the worst biochem major in the world. And I, I did it Let's be real. I went to college for the social aspects of college. Yeah, I went to a small private university coming from a, a private high school. I went with one other person from my high school. Mm -hmm. I, I knew going into it, I was going to be uh, that, that small fish in a larger pond. Mm -hmm. And I think that reality, my goal was to become a larger fish in that pond by the time that I left. And, and my, you know, I'm being dead honest because it's kind of thing to say that I, I didn't really go, I think, for the academics. I, I went for the social aspects, you know, and it, it did definitely help me later in my life, but not at the time that I was going to school. I each buy with a degree and, and then it got real. I, I moved back to the Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and it was like, guess what? You're going to go to dental school. And I did not want to be a dentist. And at that point I'd committed myself so far that I think that the hardest thing to do is to tell my father that I didn't want to be a dentist. I, uh, I, I, I manned up and I, and I told him and my dad was probably the coolest guy about it. But he said, you know, I only thought you'd be a good dentist because I see things in you that would make a great dentist. But if you don't love it, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, he finished that with, but you need to get a job. So <laughs> I kind of tooled around with things that were just like, you know, you're in your young 20s and, and back then it was like, I think I took a roofing job. I worked a, for a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And what was happening at the same time was that my father and one of his close friends were opening up their very first restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they own a restaurant in, in Palo Alto called Evia and they had another one called Kokari in San Francisco. And I actually took a lot of interest in that when they were in the planning phasing and, and, and I, I was sitting in all the meetings and I was like, oh, I think this is something I like to do. Yeah. But being the good Greek stern father that I had, you know, he, he didn't believe in like necessarily giving me a job. So I had to apply <laughs> at his own restaurant and it was a new restaurant. I don't, I don't blame him. They had a new staff, they had new management. Like you're not going to give the owner's son a job. That guy's going to be taking their job soon. It was hard to do that. So there was like conveniently never really an opening for me. And at the time, but well, not at the time, my whole life, my grandfather owned a fairly infamous nightclub in Sunnyvale, California. 
and called the Brass Rail. It's no longer there, but if anyone knows what it is, yes, I work there. It was, it was a, he built it in 1959. It was a go-go bar, you know, a strip club, something like that, whatever they allowed in Sunnyvale. And it was, the idea was shoved across. Why don't you go work for your grandfather? Learn the bar into the restaurant industry first. And I was 22 and I ended up there and I was, I'm like, I think I'm going to stay here for a while. So I did. I, I actually ran a nightclub in Sunnyvale for almost 10 years. Wow. Um, yeah. Before I, I think I escaped with my life. <laughs> I, it wasn't anything I ever intended to do. I was good at it. Yeah. But, but I was way too immature to be working in that environment and, and not really wanting to give up what was the social aspects of college. I was able to extend that college life throughout working at a club while my friends were starting to settle down and like getting tech jobs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got the party house. Everyone's at my house afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) And it was fine until that got old. And then not only did it get old, but it became in some ways dangerous too. It it wasn't a healthy lifestyle. So at the wise old age of 30 years old, I decided that it was 31 years old. It was time to leave that and really start over again. And and given the opportunity to start over again, is kind of an interesting thing, especially when you're in your thirties, because it's kind of like you can do anything if you really want to. And so I circled back to film and I, I had a very lucky but chance encounter at Lucasfilms with an artist by the name of Ian McKaig. And Ian, if you're ever listening to this, you kind of spawned my journey. So I was lucky to have a, a friend who's, she was a publicist and Lynn Hale, who was at the time, I think number one under, under George Lucas at Lucasfilms was her friend. I had dinner with her and she said, come down to the ranch. I want you to meet Ian. And so I showed up at Skywalker Ranch with a, a little portfolio of drawings I'd done in my teens. And the guy was extremely nice. He was so nice. And we spent the whole day just talking about art and film. And and I, you know, I, I was out of the game. I, I was just trying to get back in the game. I thought maybe I was going to get a job. That's, you know, at the end of this all day meeting from literally from the morning until we had dinner there. At the end of the day, he said, he's Scottish. And he's like, George, it sounds like you want to go to film school. And I was like, what? I'm like, no, I didn't say that. I, I already tried school. It didn't really work out that well. I was maybe looking for a job or something, man. He's like, no, I, you know, I have a friend, Jonathan Fung, and he's the head of the film department at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And I just, I felt bad. I felt like I owed this guy something. So he signed me up for a class oh, and wow. with absolutely no intention of going back to school whatsoever. I showed up and to, to a super eight and storyboarding class. And they put a wind up Bolex in my hand on the, the first day of class and I was hooked. Oh, and awesome. so, so I went to film school I, I, about a year into my journey in film school. I was just weird. I was, I was starting college again. I had an advisor saying, George, why are you in the undergrad program? Like I said, I don't know. <laughs> Is that what I'm supposed to do? So would you, why would you take classes over again? Like the grad program is almost exactly the same. So I transferred for the, to the grad program and I went as a director, directing major. And, and two things happened when I was in film school. One, I wanted to make films, you know, we make these student films and I wanted to make films with monsters in them. I I don't know why I just gravitated. Like all of a sudden, all the things that that I loved when I was a kid growing up, I wanted to do that for my movies. And so like, here's me in my thirties. I got 18 year old, you know, or 20 year olds in there and they're trying to be esoteric and they're trying to be, you know, they're making their movies about suicide and things. I'm I'm trying to figure out how to put a predator in a strip club because I thought it'd be funny. And so, because they said, work with what you know. And so I figured out how to build a a predator suit. And I did that because I joined an online forum, a costuming forum, and learned how to basically make one. And then the second thing that happened is I was a, I found out that I was a better producer than I was a director. I I enjoyed directing, but the, the social aspects of college the first time and what I did in the nightclub industry I was better at putting people together to work on a common goal. And I, I had this guy in my film school and I had my group of friends my film group of friends and, and we would make our student projects and we'd enter the film, the, uh, the school's film festival. And like yeah. we would come in second place to this one guy. And he was kind of like, you know, Kaz, you're out there listening. You're not a misanthrope anymore, but at the time you kind of were, let's admit it. He was like a misanthrope kid. Like he was like the the film snob and people didn't like to work with him. And he, he kind of like, kind of had this air about him that like he, he was too good for everybody else too. And he'd make these amazing films, like stop motion films. We're using like, scale figures and they were unbelievable. And it was dramatic and 
he would come in first every single time. And we had a lot of the same classes together and I became friends with him. I, I just, at that point in time, I wasn't, I'll get to it later, but I liked the guy. I thought he was kind of cool. And for some reason he liked me too. So I got a phone call from him one day, but everybody else didn't like him. They're like, I can't work with that guy. And he gives me a call and he said, I got this idea for a film, but it's bigger than, than what I do. And I'm, I'm, I'm really bad with people. Um, he's like, would you produce it? And I was like, okay, I, you know, sure. And for the first time in film school, I got to see the people that I was working with, my, my crew, work with a guy that I knew was really good, that had an amazing eye. And, and it was like, it was magic. They, they worked together great. It was so fun to watch him blossom as a director, given the tools that he needed and, and trusting other people for the first time with his vision that I was like, maybe I'm better at this. This is what I think I'm probably better at. So I switched tracks and I went to producing and I got a degree or master's in producing. And, and then most people do, you graduate and you have your, you know, what are you gonna do? And some people stay in San Francisco and they work industrials and they work things there. And I, I moved with two other people to Los Angeles because that's what you do. And I kind of hit the ground running when I got here. I, I was working within the first two weeks. I was working, at, I, I got a job with the Emmys. I, within the first wow. second week of me in Los Angeles, I was backstage at the Emmys. I know. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and, I, and I did well. And I, and I got hired on and I worked for Apple Academy Awards. So I, I ended up working, I was part of the, the uh, stage career. So I was a green room manager for, for the Academy Awards. Wow. So my first couple years in LA, it was like Spielberg, this dude, this. I was like, <laughs> it was just there, they were there. So I got over the starstruck thing right yet i still had this eye turned towards special effects i just knew nothing about it you know and so again those lucky chance encounter type situations i had a, a family friend who her father and my father went to dental school together and her best friend was a lady by the name of debbie winston and her father was stan winston who was at the time one of the biggest effects artists in the world they'd done terminator and jurassic park and Predator, that was my favorite movie. And, and so I get this phone call and this, you know, Stan wants to meet you. I was like, what? And I got this opportunity to go. Now Stan passed away you know, since then. He was in remission at the time that I had met him. They had just finished working on the first Iron Man. It wasn't out yet, but it, it was there. So I got, I got to his studio, I signed these NDAs and, and they were extremely kind to me. And they let me for the next couple of days just hang out and ask questions. At the very end of the whole meeting, Stan did two things. One, he, he gave me his Academy Awards. I have this picture of me with holding two, two of Stan Winston's Academy Awards. Like, if you're ever gonna win one, you gotta feel how heavy they are. And I was like, okay. Wow. And then, then he looked at me and he said, you know, George, he said, our industry needs somebody like you. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, these guys are amazing. I, I do not know how to do any of this stuff. He's all, well, you could just as easily produce an effects studio as you can a film. And what Stan did is, he introduced me to the idea, the, the job that I didn't know about that was effects supervision. So I quit my job. I quit working for, and I found an internship at a pro effects studio and, and I showed up and sure enough, it was a push the broom and, and do this, you know? So I, I got a job there and uh, I kept my head down for maybe three months. I just kind of like, you know, what can you do? I can trim helmets and I can paint some things. And I sat on the side and, and then they got a show. They got an alien show for the sci-fi channel and they were stumped on how to do something. And I pulled something out of my bag of tricks, something that I learned on an internet forum. I said, you could try this. And suddenly a new guy was over with the rest of the team and showing them, showing effects artists, this technique he learned online on how to make a bodysuit better or something. I forget what it was. And I was now part of the group. And so I went to Louisiana to go on a shoot and I faked it. <laughs> I, I went to film school. So I, I knew, I understood film hierarchy or the set hierarchy and I knew the vocabulary and I knew that the first AD was the guy I should become friends with. And I would make everything work for us because nothing was working for us. I had an interesting old boss and I just try to make things work for him. I try to make things work for him. So I, I came back as the studio supervisor, that, that job that Sam Minson told me about. So long story short, getting up to what I do now, I met my future business partner there. He was the lead sculptor. His name's Andrew Freeman. He's absolutely amazing. He's an incredible artist. Uh, and that's where we became friends. I don't even know if we liked each other when we first met. I think we didn't, honestly, God. But we saw good things in each other. He saw my strengths. I saw his strengths. 
And basically we stayed with this company for a while and we just, we weren't happy. You know, it's okay. It happens. And we decided to, well, I quit. <laughs> I was the first to go. I, I, I left. And, and then I think afterwards, everyone else kind of decided that, yeah, maybe they weren't happy too. And they wanted to move on. And it wasn't because they're like, everybody followed George, but it was coincidental that we all kind of left at the same time. So I, I thought it was over effects. I, I was kind of done with it. I had a buddy, I worked on a movie called Sushi Girl. It was a uh, kind of cool, slow burn gangster movie with Mark Hamill and some, some really great genre actors. And I met some really cool people working on that. And one of them was a friend of mine named Dessen Foth. And Dessen's a, a, a really brilliant writer and producer. But he was on a reality show. He, <laughs> he was on Millionaire Matchmaker. He was like the second half of like the couple that were like worked with her. And uh, Dessen's a good friend of mine. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna go work with Destin. I'm gonna go produce a movie. And so we spent some time working on writing a movie, but it just was like the process was slow and I had a newborn and I kind of needed a job and I got a phone call and it was from my friend, Andrew. And he said, Hey man, I started this mask company in my garage, you know, and I bought out my old partner. Cause I, I was aware that he had started this company because we worked yeah. together, obviously. He said, do you want to come check out my company? I said, ah, dude, I don't know. I think I'm kind of over effects. But I, I came down there and I, I did some kind of digging around and checked out what he was doing and then what his competition in the, in the world was. And I was like, man, I'm like, your stuff's really good. I'm like, why aren't you doing better than this? He's like, I don't know. And he's like, you want to come run my company? I said, okay. <laughs> so I took a job. And so three months into it, it became apparent that what we were doing was both a good fit for us as friends and that we saw potential in this idea behind the company that we're about to really start. And uh, so I told him, I said, you know, I am um, not looking for a job anymore. <laughs> I said, I'm looking for a career. I said, so I'll, I'll stay with you for a little while, but I'll mm -hmm. probably move on. I said, or sell me half the company. I said, this is a good fit and you know it. And, and so we did, and, and it was a good fit. And basically the concept that we had was that, that at the time when we left our our old boss, the effects industry was in a kind of state of flux. So was the film industry. About 10 years ago, uh, CGI was kind of catching on a little bit more. And a lot of films were being shot in Los Angeles. They were being shot in Louisiana. They were being shot in New Mexico, Michigan, Canada. And so the smaller shops were all competing for the same jobs. And it seemed like that they weren't, the, that they weren't buying. And you know, to put it bluntly, Andrew and I kind of went, said, we, you know, what do we do? We make cool masks. You know, that's, that's what we do. I said, why do we keep trying to market it at, at, at an industry that's just not buying? You know, why don't we just make cool masks and offer to anybody? Yeah. So there was this hole in the market, this mask market, the silicone mask. And what silicone masks are is they're the, the Mission Impossible mask. And that's why we titled the show what it is. They're the mask that you put over your face and you wear it and it moves with your face. And it's a 10 second application that would normally take a makeup artist six hours to do. And they're reusable every single day. And we decided to specialize in that. That we would be able to make monsters the way we wanted to make monsters and humans the way we wanted to make them without anybody telling us that, you know, what we had to do. Like, because when you're working in films, you get a script and it's like, you know, you're making their monster. You're trying to make it as cool as possible, but it's not your monster, it's their monster, you know? And so for us, we got to make things how we wanted to make them. And so we started doing this, you know, it was in a garage, like any good success story starts in a garage and it started with like five masks. And the first people to catch on to what we were doing was the haunted attraction industry, mm -hmm. um, theme parks and haunted attractions. Because what, like I said, we're doing was offering a, a 10 second alternative to a complex six hour makeup application that would have to be performed by an industry professional. Yeah. Um, and we were allowing, you know, a cornfield maze in Iowa to be able to have that Hollywood-like creature in seconds for really a nominal fee compared to what it would cost to employ that makeup artist every single day that that event was going. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so it caught on and then it got bigger and it got bigger. And then suddenly we were subletting some little bit of shop space in a warehouse that was owned by my partner's father-in-law. And then it started getting bigger and the machine started getting bigger. And then we started getting some like celebrity clients and, we're doing trade shows and conventions and everyone's kind of catching on to us. And long story short, now we're at a 13,000 know, foot facility. We have two buildings. Wow. Um, <laughs> work on a lot of really fun things. The film industry came back around. The music industry came back around. And then we built this catalog of our own masks, so like over 300 characters now. And some of them are right there. And I'll kind of explain how they work and stuff. But 
yeah, that's really our story. And so even today, you know, we're blessed every day because I really, truly get to do what I think I really would have wanted to do when I was a kid. I was a Halloween kid. I, I grew up like planning out my Halloween costume, you know, in, like in May. And so you know, this is right up my alley. Yeah, that's like so awesome. So with the five math that Immortal Mass made, what are the genesis of the math? Like, what are some of the first five maths that you well, made? Well, you, you always, if you're doing silicone masks, one of the things besides just doing the monsters and stuff like that, one of the, the biggest ones are the prank masks, are the old man. So there was an old man. You know, their grandpa was our first old man mask. That's one, you know, you'd wear and you'd prank people because you know, it looks like a real person. And then we always have this little phrase, you know, zombies, werewolves, and clowns. You know, <laughs> if, you're in the, if you're in the haunted attraction industry or Halloween industry, zombies, werewolves, and clowns. So we had a zombie, we had a werewolf, and we had a clown. And those were, that, that was the next ones. And then we started playing with different designs. Like, let's make a bird guy. So we made this one called the scavenger as a bird guy. You know, and the evolution has gotten all the way to the point now that we're pretty good at likenesses. The jobs that we've done range from like everyday collectors to I've worked for governments. <laughs> you know, if you're, wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, what we try to do now is we're our biggest competitors. <laughs> so like, well, there are some other people in the game. We're friendly with all of them. We're kind of uh, probably one of the more prolific companies. We challenge ourselves. Like we, whenever we do something, we're like, that was cool. Let's make it smoke now. Let's make, you know, let's put lights here and there and make it, it, everything that we thought wasn't possible like six years ago, we're yeah. doing now, and with, which is kind of fun. So I think that's the biggest, our biggest day-to-day -day challenge is to see if we can outdo what we did last. Hello, Comic-Con. I know that we talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Before. And every time there's Comic-Con, I get really excited. Of course, I like Marvel. I'm like a Comic-Con geek. I know that your math has to be there. They are, yeah. We're big with the cosplay groups, obviously. We have some pretty fun masks that, that fit ideally into them. I'm a San Diego Comic-Con fanatic because I, I love that. And so, you know, I was lucky enough to really get to see Comic-Con from so many different angles, being a fan and then also working in the industry. That I've been to Comic-Con on panels for movies that I've worked on. I've been at Comic-Con just to hang out. I, you know, I, I got to see it from so many different facets, you know, from like, yeah. uh, you know, sleeping on a friend's floor one time going there to, you know, Guillermo de Toro's VIP parties, you know, things like that. So, and, and then some of the people that were like the guys from Tested and from Mythbusters, Adam and, and Norm, shout out yeah. to you guys. You guys have been great. They're friends of ours. We get to go do, you know, things. Adam's parties at Comic-Con are awesome. And we've done Tested with them a few times now. Those are fun things. So it's a cool social aspect. Comic-Con is the one place that we don't go to sell anything. Like that's where I get to go be a nerd for a while too. Yeah. We, we do other conventions. There's a convention out here called Monster Palooza, which is a great effects committee. If, you're, if you love special effects, check out Monster Palooza. That happens in the spring and the fall. Obviously this year's a little different though. I think they're still planning on doing a fall event. And if you're a fan of anything in, in makeup and special effects, yeah. it is a... Uh, it's a, it's a party for effects artists masquerading as a convention. So you will go there and you'll see all your favorite effects artists and, 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 and actors and that. And we're all partying. Okay. <laughs> we're having fun and, and getting to see each other because we don't see each other all the time even though we're, it's a close-knit community. Uh, and so much of they're selling our stuff. I'll be selling my masks there and it's, it's a good time. So I definitely recommend that convention if you want to check out something a little different. What inspired you and, and the team when you're creating each piece? I see that each one is unique. And yeah. sometimes you make up character, you create characters that are not out there yet in pop culture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they may be inspired by something. Sure. So what are some of the inspiration? <laughs> sometimes there's like really dumb late night conversations between me and my partner going, you know, it'd be cool. Like a dog with all his you know, skin ripped off. Let's do it. <laughs> and so our ideas will go like, it, sometimes we'll like we'll shelve an idea for like three years and then we'll come back to it and we'll make it or it's the next day we're sculpting it we're like let's do that sometimes it's staple things like we should do another mummy or we've done one but we should do this type of mummy now and sometimes so we, we delve back into like staple characters and other times they're just like what if we did this and we put horns on it and you know our, our kind of starts very very big like we should make another demon and like what's that gonna look like i don't know and we start talking about you know well, I really liked this from the movie Nightbreed. And we'll pick apart little things that we like from archetypes that, that we grew up with, and then we'll piece them together and make our version of something cool. Like, well, let's see. Yeah, like, okay, this one. This is Scratch. She is a female fit mask, and she is a cat skull. 
she's a yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have a version of her that, with these eyes in out and she's all silicone there's resin teeth and uh Oh, that's all awesome. And this was just kind of like, we'd already done like a, a Wendigo, which was a skin kind of like bear cave looking thing. And we just kind of played off the, uh, more let's do more skinned animal type thing. So like, that's how she kind of came to be. This guy, he's actually one of our biggest sellers. I love aliens. Yeah, he's a gray. <laughs> and then the funny thing is we, we only made him about three years ago in the existence of our company. It's so awesome. I, if I had known that the simple gray alien was going to sell the way he did, we probably made this about 10 years ago, but he's very, very popular. This mask we sell so you guys can make it gray instead of green oh no we have green versions he's just <laughs> he's based off the gray the traditional gray alien the sculpture the look of it okay but the cool thing is we can paint them any way you want to so uh, if you go to my catalog you went to immortalmask.com and you looked up the, the art it's called the alien you'll find them in gray green flesh tones i can paint them red if you wanted to i can make them uv react uh, yeah yeah so this guy is new he's actually about a week old we just, just did him. He's cool too. He's like our galactic overlord slash demon. Uh, I like the little dinosaur spite thing. Yeah, is he cool? Yeah. It's really and then awesome. we, have, we have to name them. So we, we <laughs> that's a, I think the more challenging thing is naming our masks. Well, how do you name the masks? I mean, especially we, the ones that we you just name. Spip all ideas at each other. We'll just throw them out there. Sometimes we do it just to make each other laugh. We'll come up with dumb names and then it'll find its way. I'm sure this guy had, he's called Bloodhammer. It was just, we thought it was, just, we just thought it was, a, I think honestly it was just at the end, it was just a cool name. That's all it was. He threw out so many of her names and like, I think that's the one that stuck. As we see them being sculpted, they start to revealing a little bit more of their own like personality. Yeah. It was this big kind of brute looking guy, demon thing. So we called him Bloodhammer. That's he's, awesome. He's, There's no blood on him, by the way. No, oh, no. We gave him a hammer that had blood on it. <laughs> yeah, I love the little sprites everywhere. What else? This is our first big demon. So we used to keep him pretty safe in, in like sculpt form. And this was the berserker. And this is what I call a, our kitchen sink demon. Like at the time we did him. Right. We just went big. We just like, we just gave him everything that we saw that we loved from movies. We're like, let's make him creepy and have no eyes. Let's give him a skull nose. Let's give him mandibles like the predator. What else we put? Oh, how about ram horns? You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's different. We threw everything at this one, and he and he was our, our first experiment into really going going bigger. I, I, I like and, the full teeth too. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. He's a and, and hiding the form, hiding the, the trick always is is hiding when we do a monster is somewhere in there is your head, and the way yeah. that silicone mask works is that they are sculpted on something that's smaller than the human head. Mm -hmm. That means when the mask goes on your head, it goes over your head and it snaps back to the face. And so in, in its entirety, it's trying to hug your skin as close as possible so that when you move at your own facial mechanics, operate the mask. So you can get brow movement, you can smile, you can talk. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's really kind of neat. And it does that because it's sitting on your face, kind of like a sock, you know, like a, a sock is technically smaller than your own foot. So when you stretch yeah. around your foot, it hugs yeah. your foot and stays up. Same yeah. idea with, with these masks. It's almost like face detection for AI. Almost. In, in some ways, yeah. Almost. <laughs> like, because I was showing you some of my AR show series and I was yeah. just like, wow, this is so awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, in like kind of how you would map out how your AI filters would work and move with the, the human face, mm -hmm. the same idea when we're creating these masks. I mean, the first things that we had to figure out was, well, one, how do we get them to fit everybody? Because I'm making them fit like generically a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. So we realized at one point in time, we're never going to fit everybody. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So we're going to have a sweet spot. And I get a, I get a pretty wide range of, of people that can fit in this. And the next thing is how do we increase and maximize movement? And there's certain things on your face and when you're wearing a mask, you want to make sure that you're increasing surface contact between the mask and your face to mm -hmm. maximize movement. So uh, you're, whenever you're looking at something in the, as a positive, which is your face or the, or the sculpture armor you're going to be sculpting onto, you have to think about what the negative is going to look like. And there's certain aspects of our own face that, that create unnecessary peaks and valleys. And mm -hmm. like, that'd be like the nasal labia, that, that, that area between your nose and your cheeks and stuff. Yeah. That if you just kind of rounded that off, the mask would sit closer to your face or your ears because if you put a mask on your, your ears like you know will fold closer to your head so yeah. they have to be on the positive so we learned how to design our the core the thing that we're sculpting on to increase and maximize surface contact between your skin and the mask and that's really kind of the the secret it's why there's not that many of us that do this we've gotten pretty good at it 
And so within the industry, we were lucky to get to work on a lot of film projects because we're the only ones out here that do what we do. So sometimes we get called in to work on some pretty fun stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Really to see when you're wearing a mask. Like if I want to buy one of the masks for Halloween to really <laughs> scare people uh-huh. and to be in the spirit. Uh-huh. And I wear it, like, would I be able to see everything? So if I want to be an alien, you know? Right. So sometimes it's funny. If the mask has two eye holes where your eyes are, if the mask has two nose holes where your nose are, and the mouth thing, you'll get all that. But sometimes you have to make some sacrifices for the aesthetic. So, for example, that alien that you're looking at, those eyes, those giant eyes are still part of the silicone sculpture. But what you're looking at is you're looking at these holes of the tear ducts. So mm-hmm. we, we've, we figured out how to line things up correctly that so that we're never going to leave you blind, but you are going to lose a little bit off your peripheral on that specific mask. Mm-hmm. So, and it's just practice like anything else. That mask also doesn't have a nose that lines up to your nose. So you're going to be breathing out of your mouth. The ears line up so you can hear fine. So you're going to breathe out of your mouth and you're going to see how these two little holes here. And at first it might seem like a little bit daunting, but within seconds, you realize that there's really not that much tunnel vision and you're only losing a bit off your peripheral and that can be made up for with slight head turns. So you start just kind of turning more and your character kind of develops and you overcome the limitations of the mask because there's a human form under it. What about the material that make up the mask? Do you make them yourself? Well, we uh, together? Like, you do, yeah, yeah. We're using platinum grade silicone. That's It's the most skin safe and most truly true like skin. It's you know, developed for, for medical prosthesis and, and whatnot. And it has a great durometer, which means it, it, I can stretch it. It won't rip. We reinforce our masks. There's a huge team here. It's like, again, it went from this little basement company to there's 25 full-time artists here. And then I have subs like seamstresses on the outside that sew the mesh hoods that go inside the mask. We put them on, we close a mold and we're mixing uh, two-part silicone. So we mix the silicone, we base tint it. So we get all these masks start with the, uh, their base tints. Then we, we pour it and it sits for usually overnight, but really we can demold in a couple hours. Mm-hmm. Then we'll demold the, the mask, send it over to our patch and seam department. And they're very carefully remove the seam lines, take care of any little imperfections of the mask and get it all prepped up to go to our paint department. And then the interesting thing about silicone is nothing sticks to silicone but silicone. And in platinum silicone, you have a cure threshold, which means that your mask is curing for X amount of time before mm-hmm. it's fully cured. And when it's fully cured, it becomes harder to have any, any other platinum silicone cure against it. Mm-hmm. So our masks are, are made and they're cast and they're painted all in the same week. Wow. Um, we do about a hundred masks a week. We move pretty fast for what we do. And these are pretty complex pieces. I, I got to give the crew that we have here their due that I'm very lucky to have a very talented group of artists that work for us. Awesome. Yeah. One of the two words in the title is silicone mask, a peek into the world, mission impossible. Of course, it's mission impossible. Great. So what are some stories of mission impossible? Uh, well, we've done some government work and I've done some government work that wasn't even our government. All checked out through our government. You know, it's funny, you know, I get on my assumptions of what they're being used, <laughs> used for. At the end of the day, I, I'm never going to totally know. The, the, the other cool thing is that we've done things for facial recognition software companies. Mm-hmm. They want to test their software against complex disguise. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so we've done controls. Like they give us controls of people that we needed to replicate to see if it passed the software. Um, and it was, the funny thing is everyone asked me, they're all, so did it work? I'm like, I have no idea. Because the problem is my job was over when I sent the masks out. That was Fun. We did a Super Bowl commercial last year. It was kind of fun for Michael Bay. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. Jennifer Lopez was running through the Hard Rock Hotel. It was this big, like, mm-hmm. Michael Bay action sequence where someone stole her golden microphone before she did her halftime show. And she chased this person down throughout the hotel. It was this giant helicopters and everything, you know, were going. And, and, and then they clothesline the guy and they pull the ski mask off of him. And it's uh, her uh, then fiance, uh, Alex Rodriguez. And then it was like a Scooby Doo thing where they, pull the mask off of him and it's a DJ Khalid. And so we, within three weeks, I got a call directly from Michael Bay, which was one of the weirdest things in the world. Cause I didn't believe that it was him at first. I was like, what? And, and so we made this mask in about three and a half weeks of, of Alex Rodriguez just sent after them. So that was a wow. interesting, fun rush job that we did. Yeah. Wow. And it's in the Super Bowl. That's like so awesome. Yeah, now yeah. I'm now on YouTube and watch it. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we did the music video for the, the artist named Future. Mm-hmm. He did a, a video called Mask Off. Uh, at the very end, he takes off a mask of himself. And then we did that one. Yeah. Some things I can't talk about. I wish I could. There's some really, right now, especially, 
I have like four or five dream projects. Wow, because yeah. it's Mission Impossible. And, and when we say Mission Impossible, it comes with confidential stuff. Well, it's yeah. the funny thing is because the, the best way, whenever I'm talking to somebody about our masks, you know, when you tell people masks, you make masks for a living, the first thing they think of is, you know, the, the stuff that we bought when we were kids or, or a Halloween store. And it's like, they're not exactly that. <laughs> I'm like, they're like, and then you say like, you try to up the game a little bit. And you're like, they're kind of like the Ferraris of masks. But you're like, what does that mean? And then the best reference that some, everyone seems to understand is it's the Mission Impossible mask. It's the mask mm -hmm. that you can put on and look like somebody else completely. Yeah. And it will work and will fool people. And so then they're like, oh, you make those things. And they understand kind of what we do. Like the James Bond 007 mask. Yeah. Oh, I mean, there okay. moments where it's like, we're like, my partner and I were working and you know, it's like we're working on a, and I can talk to this extent because the job is sold and oddly enough, I didn't sign the NDAs. I'm just not going to go totally detailed. But like, there was a moment where I was looking at my partner. I'm like, dude, we're making spy masks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what we're doing right now. It led to some work for our own government, which was really cool too. And we got to help yeah. out some really cool stuff. Um, I'm not going to say what it was, but it was good to know that we were able to contribute a little bit to something that, that I feel was a, a good cause. Done, we've done stuff for uh, HBO Vice, even the, I, I forget the episode, but like we made some masks that, that some of the people that were being interviewed were, couldn't show their faces so that they, they were our masks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think so. those are some of the more interesting ones, you know, besides the whole Halloween and haunted attraction industry. You know, we do like Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios and we're blessed to work with another effects studio, Pat McGee and his crew, and they make some really cool stuff too. And so we've got the contract for, for doing characters for uh, Universal Studios in Hollywood for their Horror Nights. And we do 26 different Six Flags. And, uh, wow. Yeah. You play by being able to purchase your masks online? Yeah. Are yeah, like I said. Like in your studios and other places? No, no. We're a little too expensive to be in like brick and mortar stores, but you can buy any one of my masks at immortalmasks.com. Yeah. The idea behind what we were doing is we wanted to make these available to anybody. I think m when we were growing up, when I, like I said, I was influenced by movies like, you know, Alien and like mm -hmm. and Predator and, you know, in Star Wars, I was a Star Wars fanatic, you know, I grew up. Yeah. I mean, I, dude, my Star Wars, if I told you my Star Wars full circle stories, besides the whole kickoff thing starting at Lucasfilms, like, I, yeah, I've got to become friends with Mark Hamill. It, there's so many weird Star Wars connections in my life right now. It's amazing. Uh, the little kid in me would have been pretty impressed. Do, do you license different characters from the um, culture? Sure, and sure. We do have a couple licenses, some from Warner Brothers, some from more cult-like movies like Terrifier, which is like this kind of B-movie, rad, gross mm -hmm horror movie with this clown, Art the Clown, that we have, we have a license for that. There's a collectibles company called Sideshow Collectibles. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're they great. Besides the fact that they have, they do all kinds of great license pieces. I got one six scale statues all over my office and you, know, you can't see them, but they're on the walls. They happen to be good friends of ours too. They approach us with this idea. They have their own IP called the Court of the Dead. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a statue over there yeah. of a Varkas. So we do three license masks from the Court of the Dead which is really cool. The third one's coming out very shortly. We've got two right now, and the third's coming out, I think, in a couple months. Pennywise, the clown, we did that. And it's quite scary. Yeah, yeah. So, and we did that, and then we we got hired, like, to... There was a movie called Bright on Netflix with Will Smith, and it was, like, an orcs. And so we got hired to do the promotional campaign for Bright, so I had to make 92 orcs in three weeks. Yeah, wow. the, to promote their movie. Yeah, it was like uh, Netflix's first giant uh, blockbuster temple movie. Mm -hmm. both and stuff. So we were, we're fortunate to work with them on that. And we got to do some other cool Netflix. We did this movie called um, Hubie's Halloween, which is uh, uh, Adam Sandler that came out this year. And yeah, the stuff that we're working on now, man, I, catch me in another couple months and I'll tell you what they are. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the stuff that we're doing now is, like, is, like, is now kind of like the most fun I think I've had in a while, besides our own line. Yeah, especially on their dream project. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to share that I have not asked you? No. I feel like I've talked enough. Like I, I mean, you do a great job. Ask whatever you want. I sometimes get carried away and I just keep talking. So if there's anything specific that you think I should be talking about, you go ahead and let me know. How about talking about woman masks or woman heroes or mm -hmm. woman monsters? Or right. Something? When we first started this thing, we were under the impression that girls didn't want to wear masks because they like to wear makeup and they don't want to put this on. Girls like to wear these things. Girls want to be monsters. And and we've been having, a, honestly, since we introduced, it was a couple of years behind our, our, our male fit line because we started with like a single sculptural core. 
that we introduced the female line of masks. And they're our most fun characters to make. We have some great ones. If you go to my website, there's an android called Machina. It's like, she's really gorgeous in the face. And then behind her has all these great light up features. And like, it's just a really neat mask. That's awesome. See, yeah. if you have, like female masks, you could be really creative because like you can have different makeup, different light, different style it's, clothing, it's, right? Some of the designs for our female fit masks are my favorite. We have a, a, a sphinx cat, like a, a hairless cat that, mm -hmm. that we find eventually, it's funny. So we were doing masks, just like we're making these ones for the girls and like they get this one. And then the guys were like, I want that. <laughs> so like we eventually would make a version for that. But we have like, we did a mermaid mask. that was really cool. It was oh, all, that is yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah. Some, there's, some, there's some really cool, we're, we're always developing our female line. It's like, it's one of our favorite things to do. Still gotta play a little catch up to our male fit masks, but we're getting there. Yeah, no, look, so, so when I was making AR, like, for Halloween, and you saw the one that I sent you, the right. zombie one, I, I just feel like there were a lot of, and I was surprised, because it, the one that made was really bloody, and uh -huh. it might have been, like, one version of it was rejected by the platform, because it was too gruesome. Really? We don't really censor ourselves. Um, we just kind of go for it, so, so yeah, we have some pretty disturbing pieces at times. That's awesome. But the female, the woman love them. And, 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 they and do. That was, that's just so rad. They, they do. Know? And they have so much fun in them. And, and our, yeah. our female client base is like, they're always pushing us. The good news is I have like, I have two business partners. I feel bad. I should have like said that at the beginning. So my business partners are a married couple, which is awesome because it becomes really much a family. And Michelle Freeman, who's a, my, my other business partner, She's the backbone of this company, really, when it comes down to it. She whips us into shape because we the boys will be boys thing. We like sometimes get a little, you know, <laughs> it's a little too rambunctious. And Michelle knows how to keep us in check. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And, but Michelle is like, she's probably more of a pop culture fanatic than I think me and her husband are. So she really brings in some really cool elements to like ideas. And, yeah. You know, yeah. And she fights us on them too. She's like, I get my idea next. So. Yeah, and then you get better at everything that you do because of that. Yeah, you said know, yeah. we feed off each other's energy, good or bad, <laughs> and so and, and that just leads to a better creative environment. And then let's like, like any other family, you know, like and that's really what we are. Because even even as we get larger, we're technically still like a very very much like a family business. Um, you know, we're very we're very close. You know, my they're they're my inner circle. So I, I think like in any kind of partnership, you go through the, your growing pains and the. And you get to this nice place where like where we are all now, where we know each other so well, we're so comfortable with each other that we don't really, we don't aggravate each other like we probably used to because we know each other well. We know that's not what we're intending to do. The ideas flow freely. We have each other's back. We know that, you know, and so it's a really good partnership. I'm lucky to have two really good. Yeah, that's awesome. And George, yeah. where, do, where can people find you? Uh, where you can find us, okay, so our website is www.immortalmasks.com. The same name on Instagram, the same name on TikTok, the same name on, on Facebook. Yeah, our Facebook and our Instagram is pretty prolific. We do have a Twitter. I don't use as much. I, I don't know why. I, I, I should, but. I got to find you on TikTok for sure. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of, it's funny. Our TikTok was like, we went strong and then we kind of like settled down. And we went strong again and then we settled down. So it's like. I got to jump back into it, probably post some more things on there. But. Yeah, I, I try to do TikTok every week, but that's just because I do it for fun. And, and it's not related to a company, but it's nice that, you know, that you guys have a TikTok because I think that's... Well, we, have a, we have a YouTube channel where, which I honestly it built the YouTube channel as a direct link. So whenever we upload our, our movement videos, so every time we do a new mask, we make sure we costume it correctly. I have an actor that comes in. If we want to put cool like, contacts in them, we'll do that too. I really want to show the mask to its its potential. And so we make movement videos for every one of our masks and I upload them to our YouTube channel. So even though it's, they're really meant as a direct link to our website, each mask has a page where they show how the mask moves. You can literally watch every single one of the movement videos I've ever, ever made in general. Wow, awesome. I'll check it out too. Yeah. And what is that one piece of wisdom that you have for the community? It's funny. It's so my dad's the guy I look up to probably the most, you know, I, he's, he's my mentor and my rock and my stability. So when I went back to school for my second degree, when I was in my thirties, I, you know, I didn't listen to my dad very much. <laughs> I was younger, but I was willing to listen this time. And he gave me some advice. I think he gave me the advice when I was 18, but I didn't listen to him. But when, yeah. he, when I was like in my thirties, he, he said, he said, it's not a popularity contest. He's like, go find the best and work with them. And you know what? He was right. And I think that's a thing I could impart anybody is there's everything that we do in our in, in our lives is communal you know and if you want to excel at something 
you can count on your counterparts to help you do that. And so if you want to excel at something, I would suggest go find the best, learn from them, you know, work with them. You'll get everything you want to get out of it and don't make it a popularity contest, you know? Yeah, I think I just learned that recently too, just within the last couple of days. Someone said that a company starts with a CO because it has community in it, you know, where it involves a team of different people. It's easier to succeed that way. So I think the key part is just working with different people. And I just never realized that company even has It's so, it's so true. Like, like even like, as I told the story from before when I was in film school, I found my guys, right? And then I found this other guy and my guys were really cool with the other guy and he was really cool with them. But I knew that if they worked together, they would find something in each other, that commonality, that was the, that singular vision that they all had for this film. And they all became friends, you know? And it rang true. I was actually seeing the, my father's advice that he gave me ring true in other things too. And even when I got to Los Angeles, which is a trippy place because, you know, it's kind of a giant popularity contest in some ways yeah. in LA. But again, I think I navigated that. And, and then I went and I found the best and I, you know, and I worked with them. And now it's given me the opportunity to work with, with heroes of mine in the industry. Because I was into special effects, I used to like, you know, read about them and, and, and the effects artists that I grew up knowing about through magazines or later in the internet, they became part of my peer group later, which is really kind of cool because I'm like, you know, some hasty boy or heroes of mine. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but they're, they're cool because they're also friends. Together, though, I mean, the biggest conflict within a company, and the number one thing that breaks up a company is usually internal conflict, and they're the, also the most valuable. You seem to be able to work with the best people, put them together, and kind of work with them for years. How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of putting ego aside sometimes, you know, I think that's one of the things. Sometimes you also have to kind of you have to reconcile when sometimes something's not a good fit. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It just means it's not a good fit. And now and again, we've had that happen where it's just like, we work with somebody that we really admired, but the fit wasn't good. And there's no harm, no foul of that. You don't have to make it a bad thing. It's just maybe it just wasn't a good fit. And then you have to be okay with that. Yeah. And then when you see talent, yeah. you see a good person, you got to remember to champion that. Because see, life gets in the way sometimes and pressures and stresses and stuff like that of any job can yeah. cause you to focus on those negative aspects. They're there. They're real. You have to focus on them. But you got to remember all the good things too because yeah. those people are helping you deal with those stressful moments. So like when we're dealing with a project that might have a deadline or be stressful, I try to do the best I can to remember the people that are helping me get to that finish line and, yeah. and champion them. So, yeah. That's awesome, George. I just want to thank you for your time. I mean, I'm really <laughs> excited about this. Oh, I appreciate it. I really do. It's fun to talk to some people from my hometown area about what I do. For <laughs> so I really appreciate the, the opportunity to come out and say something about it. Yeah, let's also do a follow on like next time when yeah. uh, we can talk about certain things. Hopefully, hopefully by then, God, it's like so funny if I, I can't do it, but if I turn my camera this way, there's a couple things in here that you can see that I, I probably get in trouble for right now. Yeah, not yet. But in a month time or two, I can openly talk about them. And apparently I'll be able to, it's just, I can't wonder being <laughs> Okay, bye-bye, George. It was good talking to you, I'll see you later.